Yeah, I just said that. Good morning, y'all. Good morning and welcome, as always, to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. How good it is to be present. 
how good it is to be uh, in this celebration, for certainly the celebration of Christmas, though, it's, though we've undecorated and though the 12 days have passed, we have been brought into this season of epiphany, into this continuing season of the recognition of the Lordship of Christ that we are all a part of Christ's body, that we are all gathered here to be part of what God is doing in the world today. Might we see it this morning? Might we hear it this morning? As we join with each other and as we join in the presence of God in our midst, might we be moved in this new creation? Might we be moved in the way that God is moving here and now? You can see some of the things that we are moving into in our bulletin this morning. Uh, you can see what we have coming up in, in the following week. Uh, we have a deacons meeting uh, directly after worship. We'd invite you, if you are a serving deacon, to be present for that meeting. Uh, we have Lydia Circle uh, at Wednesday at 1 and Bible study on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, of course, Bible study is available through Zoom as well. So if you don't want to gather in person, um, if you're joining us online and are still uncomfortable being present in person, we do offer that through Zoom. Zoom. You can find the Zoom link for Bible study in our praises and prayers email that goes out early in the first half of the week. Um, we have our uh, senior, first senior choir meeting this Thursday at 6.30. Uh, the first of the year, if you are interested in any way in being a part of choir, uh, it doesn't matter what your talents or skills are. Um, I've heard, I think, each and every one of you speak at some point in time that qualifies you for the choir. So if you wish to be present for this, uh, that is Thursday at 6.30 here. Um, with all these things, there is an opportunity to be present. There is an opportunity to offer our presence as a present to this congregation, to the body of Christ in this world, indeed for the kingdom. So in whatever way you feel led, whatever skills and gifts you have personally, whatever time you have to give, might it be an opportunity for us to gather? Might it be an opportunity for us to serve? And in this spot, might we be able to gather in worship? So I invite you to join into our call to worship this morning. Behold, God is making all things new. God is the Alpha and Omega. We enter this new year with hope. For God has drawn near to us. We are Christ's body. Amen. May we join together in our opening hymn, As With Gladness. we join together then in an attitude of prayer, first of silent prayer, naming to God that which we bring here that we are joyful, that which we are mournful. And all these things, might they be brought to God 
who hears us, who knows us, who knows what we speak even before we do. But in our speaking, in our naming, in our crying out to God, might God choose to move for good on our behalf, to be the mender and the bridge builder and the healer and the sanctifier that we know God to be. I then invite you to hear the morning prayer and to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Awesome God, author of salvation, advocate and paraclete, and son of God, God with us, Emmanuel. We know you in so many ways, and in each of these ways, there is cause to give you thanks and praise. In the many ways that we know you through the many people that have experienced you, who have heard your voice, who have seen your mighty deeds in this creation, each and every one of them have shared, have been so moved by who you are that they can't stop their lips, that they cannot quit their praises. God, we have seen you too. We have heard your still speaking voice in this world. This is why we are gathered here, O oh God. For in your presence we bask and celebrate. In the knowledge that you are with us here and now we sing praises to you. Our very countenance is changed. For if it weren't for you, we would be lost, O oh God overcome by the despair and brokenness and the hate of this world. But through your stories, through the life of your Son, through death and resurrection, we know that this is not the way things should be. You challenge us to see the world new as you call us to a better way. Sometimes with gentle nudges and sometimes with mighty wind, you show us this better way. You proclaim to us your kingdom. Indeed, you have given us your son, God with us, Emmanuel, the Christ, the Messiah, the incarnate one whose celebration has just ended. You have given this one that we might know you more fully that we might move beyond mystery and know you. And though this short season of celebration has ended, we are Christmas people. We recognize that the world was inherently changed, foundationally made anew with the presence of your Son amongst us. This presence that leads to hope in the midst of despair a drive to bring together in the midst of dispersion. Great God, we give you thanks for this message of wholeness, of abundance, of, of life abundant and overflowing beyond our comprehension. But when we leave this place, we find we still struggle with the world around us. It is hard in this time of, of anger and division uh, where we have all suffered some trauma in the past couple years to recognize that, that the world is being mended by you, O oh God. That there is so much good happening. Allow us to see fresh. Open our eyes 
to see and to be challenged by what we thought was true so that we might know truth in you. Might we seek out still in the season of epiphany that one who has been born king of the Jews. Might we go forward from this place in hope and in perseverance that we might continue to seek out the Lord in our midst and indeed that we might be Christ's hands and feet in all that we do here. Might we be mutually uplifted by the perseverance of the saints among us by the fellowship of the faithful, that we might continue in everything good, that we might live peaceably so far as it depends on us with each other. Might we be peacemakers? Might we be those that bridge this gap? Might we see goodness even beyond our small circles to the outsiders, to the enemies? Might we see goodness in all of this, might we simply live out the commands that your Son has given us in preaching and teaching that we strive to live out. Indeed, might this gathering be one of reconciling into, uh, so that our very words are the same. Might this be true as we pray together those words that your Son has given us, as we say in one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us then to hear our scripture reading for this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you wish to follow along, I would invite you to find the Pew Bible that should be right next to you. Feel free to grab into Matthew and read along. This is Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. They sent, then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May God add a blessing to this and every reading of God's holy word. I invite us into an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with our gifts, with all that we are, with the spiritual gifts that you have created in us that we have worked to hone that they might be worthy of paying homage to the Christ. We come before you with our time that we might give it to you as we join in fellowship, as we seek to be at one with the faithful few gathered. We come with ourselves, for we are offering all that we have as gifts to you, O oh God. 
in so doing, might all that we are, all that we say, all that we think, all that we act upon, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a movie that was put out in 1979 called The Villain. Have y'all ever seen this? Okay, this is going to be a rough illustration. Bear with me. It's a funny movie. It's a, a spoof on the classic Western, right? It's Kirk Douglas and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Anne Margaret, and it's somewhere between a Wild West action movie and Wiley e. Coyote meets the Roadrunner. It's a fun movie. There's a lot of slapstick. There's a lot of um, uh, tropes that are used. Uh, it, it's a really engaging movie. It's been a long time since I've seen it, so I don't know if some of it might be questionable. Give me a little grace on that. I appreciate it. But I will say that one of my favorite things about this movie is the way that it plays tropes. Who do you think's the bad guy in this? Oh, this, see, okay. Now, this is interesting. This is interesting. Yeah, it, it, if you don't know Kurt Douglas, and if you don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger, just by the clothes they're wearing, who do you think is the bad guy? Kurt Douglas. Why, why would Kurt Douglas be the bad guy here? The mustache, does it? The black hat and the black shirt. Okay. When Schwarzenegger, of course, here with the white hat, the blue shirt. So that's exactly the way this movie is played. Kurt Douglas is the bad guy. He's scheming. He keeps trying to catch uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his wiles, right? Uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the triumphant good guy, can do no wrong, and he ends up uh, accidentally doing the right thing every single time. There's a big twist at the end of the movie, but if no one's seen it, I'm not going to ruin it for you. I, I think we're past the statute of limitations since this was put together in, 60, or in 79, but... Go out to the library and rent it if you'd like. There's a reversal. But what I can say is I love the trope of Westerns, right? Of, of, of the good guy wearing the white. Of the good guy uh, being spotless in, in the Wild West. Did, did, I, I, did you ever think of that? That the, the good guy is always just absolutely clean, never any dust on him at all, even though he's in a desert and probably not bathing? The good guy is always blameless, always spotless, and you can always tell who the good guy is in a good Western. Like Shane, you know that Shane's the good guy. I was actually going to call this sermon the good, the bad, and the baby, uh, but it was a little too late in the week to change it, so I had to step that back. This relates to our story today, to Epiphany. Because there is a reversal about who's supposed to be the good guys, who's supposed to be the bad guys. Now, we miss this because we've grown up hearing the Epiphany story. Who's the bad guy in the Epiphany story? Herod. Herod. Herod should be the good guy. If you were reading this for the first time in the first century, you would expect Herod to be the good guy in the Epiphany story. Why? Because he's the Jewish king. He's supposed to be the one that's looking out for his people. Isn't that what potentates are supposed to do? Isn't it true that politicians are supposed to serve their constituents? That wasn't a joke. It's sad that everybody laughed. <laughs> It's the thought that those in power are supposed to serve others. Herod is a bad guy in this story, and it's a reversal. And if we dig a little bit deeper about who Herod the Great is, we can understand why he was a bad guy. He was supposed to be good. He did a lot of good things. You don't get the moniker, the Great, without doing some great things, right? Herod the Great was called the Great because he was an architect. He was a builder. He spent a lot of his time uh, doing public service works. He, he, he built uh, things. He, he grew uh, the economy. He, he, um, he built the temple. And that's why it was called Herod's Temple. He got a lot of people on his side by doing things like that. But he also wasn't really Jewish. He was from a southern country. 
that didn't practice Judaism. And as he started to take control, because he was buddies with the Caesar, he took on the mantle of faith so that those folks would follow him. Hmm. Herod was a bad guy because he, he tried to use the, the, the popular faith as a way to control people. He took it and he wielded it like it was a weapon. He wasn't Jewish, but he played into all the popular Jewish holidays. Uh, he showed up to make an appearance and to do the princess wave. He was a bad guy in more than just those ways. He was a power-hungry tyrant that ended up killing some of his sons so that he could maintain power. What's the massacre of the innocents when you're killing your own family? It's all the more confusing because the folks that we think should be the bad guys are the magi. We don't even probably think of them as bad guys now when we hear this story, do we? We hear of them as kings, as wise men, as magi. They're the folks that brought really terrible gifts for a baby, right? Gold and frankincense and myrrh, things you should never give to a, child, to a child. They were gifts to symbolize the nature of the Christ. They were gifts that you would give to a dead king, foreshadowing and symbolizing the life and the death that Jesus would lead. But in any other time, if these folks showed up in the Bible, they would have been the bad guys. They're magi. They're magi, which means that they're priests of Zoroastrianism, uh, th this other religion, which actually still exists today, but was one of the prominent religions in the world at this time. Uh, it was the, the, the chief religion of Persia, of, of Media, uh, and they were known for a, a few certain things, these priests were. They were known uh, as, as a bit of uh, occultists, right? They, they can read the future. They knew what was going to happen because they could discern from the stars. Astrology, and of course astronomy and astrology was very much the same thing at the time. But they were magicians. In fact, the word that we get magician from is magi. This is a problem because throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there is a condemnation of magicians, of necromancers, of folks that use questionable sources to maintain power or to find out truth. And in fact, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there is a direct condemnation of folks that practice magic. Deuteronomy 18.10 tells us, let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, or engages in witchcraft. Leviticus 19.26-31 through 31 tells us, you shall not eat anything with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them and be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, 27 tells us, A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now could you imagine if Mary and Joseph tried to follow every letter in the Hebrew scriptures when the Magi showed up? The Magi come bearing gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and Mary and Joseph just start throwing rocks at them? That would have been a different story, huh? But we see the Magi as the good guys. Even though, to anybody reading this story in the first century, they would have been the bad guys. This story is a complete reversal of who we expect to be good and who we expect to be bad. It's a literary uh, joy to read this story because what you expect is not what happens. The one that should offer protection, the one that should care, the one that should uh, give of themselves, King Herod. Herod the Great ends up committing atrocities. And the ones that we think of as less than, as wholly other, as completely divided by religion and practice and thought, those are the ones that worship the Christ. Ones from another religion. Ones that practice something that would be condemned by any good Jewish person. So Mary and Joseph actually have to flee their own king when they are welcomed by outsiders and foreigners and strangers. 
This is a challenge not only to the way we hear the story today, but to the way that we apply it to our lives today. We must question that maybe the best thoughts aren't coming from our in-groups. We must consider that maybe there is truth outside, amongst the others, amongst the strangers, amongst the enemies. And let's be honest. In the world that we live in today, everybody's an enemy. We are so divided that if you don't believe exactly like I do, you must be the other. Unworthy of my consideration, unworthy of dignity, unworthy of my time or my love. This story directly confronts that thought. It challenges us to look beyond who we are, beyond who we're comfortable with, beyond who we would normally listen to, to consider them and to love them. Folks that would be, if we followed the Hebrew Scriptures, would call us to, to condemn them to death. They are the very ones that brought truth in this situation, where the one who was supposed to bring truth brought lies. Let's be honest. We live in a place where religion, just like the first century, was corrupted and coerced for power. How many people do we think take on the mantle of Christianity so that they can get more votes or that they can get more donations or that they can get more power or prestige? How many people do we think say that they are Christ followers just so others will follow them? How many folks do we disregard? How many folks do we dismiss? How many folks do we look at with suspicion and avarice because we think of them as the other, because we think of them as unworthy, because they have a different opinion or a different worldview or a lens that was shaped by different world experiences than ourselves? This is a challenge to open up. This story directly confronts our sensibilities and tells us that we can find truth anywhere if we are willing to look for it and if we're willing to be gracious. Because Mary and Joseph didn't start st stoning the Magi, they received wondrous gifts and they received information and protection. The story continued because they acted as God would have them act and not as they were told to act. There is a difference there. We must consider here and now how many folks are telling us these things, telling us different directions and different thoughts, pulling our consciousness and our time and our energy in different directions, when all we must do to find truth is to seek the kingdom of God above all else. Mary and Joseph continued this story. The infancy narrative was allowed to happen because they were looking for God and not for the truth of human beings. They were able to find truth in unexpected places and to beware of the dangers of an insider group that did not offer protection. How would this apply to us today? I think that all of our decisions should be based on the kingdom and not on our own truths. I think that every moment that we decide on something, it should be based on God's will and not the will of politicians or preachers, let's be honest, or anyone, but the will of God. If this action promotes love of neighbor as we love ourselves, if this decision promotes love of God above all else, if this opportunity allows for these two things to combine in a rich way, then it is the right decision. But if it's someone telling you that they're the outsiders, those folks are wrong, those folks are unworthy, not worth our time, our effort, our love, that is not from God. But God can speak to anybody. Thank God, God speaks to anyone, to magi or to potentates, to Gentiles and to Jews. 
to sinners and to saints. How good is it that God is here now speaking to each and every one of us that we might hear God above our own voices if we listen. The power of epiphany is the truth that God lays out paths for us to follow. Whether it's a star, whether it's a stranger, or whether it's God speaking here, God continues to lay out paths for us that lead to the kingdom. And our decision-making should take into account whether we are moving towards the kingdom or towards the dreams of someone else. Hold them and weigh them and find that all that we can do can counteract this brokenness in this world, this discouragingness that we have struggled through, this trauma that we have been bound by, that causes us to make decisions that are based in fear or in hate. God offers a different path. And if you look to the star, or if you hear God speaking, or if you see truth that leads to the kingdom, it's worth following it. That's what continues the story. That's what kept the infancy narrative from ending with King Herod. So pray and discern and gather and have difficult conversations and love that we might hear God still speaking now. Might we become attuned to it? Might we become in such a way that we practice it like a healthy diet so that the run eventually becomes easier? In our prayer life, in our spiritual life, might we practice these things that allow us to hear God more readily? to find hope in difficult situations, to gather in such a way that we are upbuilding to one another and that we allow this story to continue with the grace of God. But to do that, we need to keep seeking. We need to keep looking. So might we, as the Magi, or as Mary and Joseph, or even those shepherds, might we be still seeking. Amen. There is a power in this table. Not, not this table, but in this table. There is hope and love and joy in this table. Not this table, but this table. A table that is not confined to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, but a table that can be found wherever faithful are gathered whether it's ornate and engraved or whether it's a collapsible table, it is powerful. It's powerful because whenever we gather around it, we know exactly what it is. Because we have practiced this for years, we know how we should act. We know what we should do. And I'm not just talking about that, that discomfort when you go to a different table and you're not quite sure how communion goes down at that church. Isn't that a, a scary thing that happens when you, when you end up at a different church and no one knows how to do communion? Are we supposed to leave the cup in the pew? Are we supposed to drink at the same time? Are we supposed to take it home? I'm sure it's been difficult even for us because we've changed over the past couple years how we have communion. But that ritual, that sameness, it allows us to know the motions, to understand the practice in a powerful and real way. Here at this table, we recognize that no matter how we practice communion, the presence of God is here, calling us to remember the stories that God has revealed to humanity, that we might know what God is going to do in the future. This is how we hear God, because in the ways that we have heard God, we know that God will be. I am that I am. I will be what I was. We know God because we have seen God. We know God because we see God now. We know God because we hope that we will see God in the future. 
here at this table. We practice seeing and knowing and listening that that practice of being close to God might be all that much more easy. We practice amongst friends and those close to us because we can feel comfortable in this space, protected and safe as this is a sanctuary. But in our gathering, we go through these motions because there is power to the ritual. Though it might just be bread and cup, we recognize here, in a culmination of events, the entirety of the teachings of Christ, the entirety of the life and the death and the resurrection that leads towards the realm of God. And in practicing communion here, we participate in the realm of God. In breaking bread with each other and sharing a cup, we proclaim that we have heard God and we will live with God as we live with each other. So I invite you to hear, as it was handed on to me, that on the night that Jesus last ate with friends and with family, he took a loaf of bread, and after having blessed it, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. And after having blessed it, said, This is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we have the opportunity to eat this bread, to drink this cup, we practice what we preach. We recognize all that Christ has taught us and all that we are called to teach the world. And we will proclaim these things until Christ comes to us again. So I invite you to take that bread and to partake as Christ's body broken for you. And in like fashion, that cup as Christ's blood shed for you. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we ask your blessing as we take part in this bread and this cup. As we begin this new year, may we be recommitted in your love and sacrifice imbued in these emblems. May we start this year with joy as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, thank you for joining us together in a place where we can so freely give our gifts of time and spirituality and just being present as well as our energies. Thank you for giving us a safe place where we can give and be together. Amen. Might we join together in our closing hymn, We Three Kings.
anybody wants some extra credit homework this week, I would invite you to try and rewrite Three Kings so that it's scripturally accurate. But the indeterminate amount of magicians doesn't quite have the same ring to it as we Three Kings. All right, here then our benediction. Go forth reflecting the glorious light of Christ in this darkened world. Shine in the bleakness and misery. Shine in shadows and gloom. Shine in hearts when hope is failing. Shine in the lives of the hopeless and lost. Shine in our world when systems and structures of the world oppress and condemn. Shine for all, so that that light reflected, bright morning star, might illumine all the earth. Bright morning star, God with us, light the way. Amen.